to be talking to you about today is Munchausen's. Um, and before I start, I have a case study for you to have a look at. So a 30-year-old woman in Spain came into the hospital complaining of anuria and general discomfort, and she had fevers. Her previous medical history showed that she had a chronic kidney disease, um, and the cause was unclear for this, and she had dysrhythmia, so her heart was beating too slowly. Um, and for her dysrhythmia, she had a permanent pacemaker fitted, um, and her previous blood works showed that she had increased levels of creatinine. So all of her medical history was consistent with the diagnosis and what she was saying. But when she came to this hospital in Spain, and she got her tests done on her, and all her scans done, all of her scans and all of her tests came back completely fine. So does anyone have an idea as to why this might have happened, or what might happen? Oh. Sorry? <laughs> Munchausen's. Yeah. So, well, yeah, she did have Munchausen's, but does anyone based on this kind of have an idea as to what it actually is? Is it more like psychological rather than... Exactly that. Not even just psychological, but she didn't have any of these diseases. So the actual definition of this... Munchausen's is more commonly known now as a factitious disorder imposed on yourself. So essentially what it involves is the person co like being completely deluded and believing that they have these symptoms and falsifying these symptoms. But not only are they falsifying it, they're also inducing them. So by taking medication to induce these symptoms, just to present themselves as sickly, they'll then go to hospitals and medical professionals in hopes of getting another diagnosis. So. For example, in the case study I showed you before, she didn't have a uh, chronic kidney disorder. What she did was, so this lady was a nurse, um, and her profession allowed her to transport her own blood work around the hospital. And what she would do is she would add drops of urine into her blood sample, so that when they tested it, they would find increased levels of creatinine. And then when the doctors saw that increased level, they would then diagnose her with some sort of kidney disorder. And the same with her dysrhythmia. So she was found to be taking heart rate altering uh, drugs. And when she took those drugs, her heart rate changed and then she was fitted with a permanent pacemaker. So you can kind of see why it's so severe and why it's really dangerous. But another factor to that is that Munchausen's is very, very difficult to diagnose. So there's quite an extensive and very specific criteria for it to be considered as Munchausen's. I've narrowed it down to two main points. And the first one is that in order to have Munchausen's, you can't, have ha you can't have a pre-existing mental disorder before. So, for example, if a patient has schizophrenia and they have hallucinations, and then they go to a doctor and say that I'm, you know, I'm ill with these different illnesses, that wouldn't be considered Munchausen's, purely because she already has an existing mental disorder. And in schizophrenia, you know that hallucinations will cause you to believe all sorts of delusional things. So in order to have Munchausen's, it's really important that you don't just believe, you actually act on it. So like again, the lady in the first case study, she believed she had these illnesses, but she went one step further and took the drugs to actually elicit a response in her body. Uh, and then the second point is that they must keep up the charade of having these symptoms, even when there's no tangible incentive. So what I mean by a tangible incentive is something like money through the form of donations or support. Um, with Munchausen's, because it's a psychological disorder, what people tend to look for more is something like sympathy and attention, or like intangible incentives. So if you have Munchausen's, it's really important that you are still presenting with these fake symptoms, even when no one is offering you money, when no one, no, when no one is supporting you, because what you're really looking for is that emotional connection that you lacked. Um, and I'll explain the causes of that more, um, like further down. but. So that kind of segues into the third point I've made, is that Munchausen's can get confused quite commonly with different disorders. So there's one called malingering. And malingering is essentially where you falsify or exaggerate symptoms that you already have in order to, say, get out of work, or in order to avoid a task, or in order to gain money. So that's different from, that's different from Munchausen's, because Munchausen's is sometimes tangible, but it's mostly for the psychological needs, like attention and sympathy. Um, and because of these criteria, it's really difficult for a doctor to diagnose it. So the longer it remains undetected, the more dangerous for the, pe uh, the patient. And there's another form of Munchausen's called Munchausen's by proxy. 
principally it's the exact same so it's the same uh, cause it's the same effect and the person will do the same thing except this time it's known as a factitious disorder imposed on someone else meaning that the person who has Munchausen's the person that will receive the diagnosis is falsifying symptoms for another person um, and in most cases the perpetrator if you will yeah so the perpetrator is a caretaker um, and most of these caretakers are mothers so I think I have statistics on the next slide but if you are familiar with the case of Gypsy Rose this is exactly what happened to her so she was stuck in an abusive relationship with her mother who had Munchausen's by proxy and what she did was she continually fed Gypsy Rose lies from her young age so she told her that she had leukemia she was confined to a wheelchair um, at one point she got Gypsy Rose to shave all her head off uh, all her hair off sorry um, because she was convinced that she had leukemia and not only did that take a massive mental toll on Gypsy but she went to massive lengths like Gypsy was consuming a, a, an extensive amount of medication and she was isolated from her school from her peers and that isolation is a very common tactic that abusers use uh, because what it does is it makes the victim fall more into you know, like it aligns them with the abuser's beliefs so Gypsy Rose at one point said that she genuinely did think that she had all of these diseases and then of course it was proven to be false so not only is Munchausen's medical abuse Munchausen's by proxy especially when it's done to a child which is often the case is child abuse so it does need to be taken quite seriously so causes of Munchausen's the main cause is uh, a personality disorder so either a borderline personality disorder or a histrionic personality disorder histrionic personality disorder is essentially an excessive emotional need for attention um, like too much to the point where you will do things like this to gain any form of recognition um, and then another common one and this one's present in most cases is the abuser themselves will have had a uh, past of abuse so in their childhood or in their past they would have been physically or sexually abused and then they will have then continued that cycle of abuse by doing all of this to their child so in Munchausen's by proxy uh, like I said most cases show that the perpetrator is a mother doing this to her child so right so 95.6 percent is the mother um, which is quite extensive <coughs> And, oh, another thing I didn't mention is most abusers, or in most cases, are female, and oftentimes a lot of victims are male. So, it's not always male abusers. And even though it's a very complex disorder, there are quite a few telltale signs that someone can look out for. And the first one is doctor shopping. So, doctor shopping is exactly what it sounds like. The person will go to multiple different medical facilities, in different states and often in a short period of time just to get different diagnoses different, just to get different diagnosis and second opinions because they won't either they won't be happy with the diagnosis they got in the first one or they'll want to build more and more illnesses to have diagnosed so doctor shopping is the first one and the second one is if the patient is insistent on a particular diagnosis and even if the tests show that it's completely negative they won't be happy with that, and often then their next line of action is, like I said, going to a different facility. Um, and to add to this point, in a lot of cases of Munchausen's, the person who has it, or who is diagnosed with Munchausen's by proxy, is very well educated. So either they're a doctor themselves, or they're a nurse, like from the first case study. Um, but because they're so well educated, they have an extensive knowledge of different drugs and different diseases and what they can falsify. So this means that inducing the illness for them is very easy because they know exactly the right drugs, they know which drugs to take, and they know how this reaction is going to you know, be presented. So that also links to the, this one. I think is probably one of the most obvious signs. If a doctor is telling the patient that your scans came back completely clear, your tests are fine, your x-ray is fine, everything's okay, you can be discharged. Not only will the patient be unhappy, but in a lot of cases, the patient will be quite aggressive and become violent, and they'll go so far as to threaten some hospitals with malpractice, just because they didn't get the diagnosis they wanted, and they aren't happy with the news that they're completely healthy. The next one, yeah, this one's kind of similar. Uh, refusal to accept a non-medical diagnosis. That could be anything. So the that could be the doctor telling them, that your case isn't surgical, it's not medical, we will be transferring you to a psych ward. 
and the patient won't be happy with that because for them what they're looking for is a concrete diagnosis with something wrong in their physical, like in their anatomy and they won't take that news very well. So this one seems very obvious but uh, in Munchausen's by proxy, if you separate the victim from the perpetrator, the victim's symptoms will be completely gone. So they won't experience, they won't present any of the symptoms they claim they have. Um, however, when the perpetrator is reunited with the victim, they'll start presenting those symptoms again. And oftentimes the caretaker doesn't even have to do anything. So if it's a mother, for example, she won't have to say anything to the child or you know, do anything and administer any drugs. All that's required is for the perpetrator to see the mother not the perpetrator, sorry, the child to see the mother, and they will fall back into their patterns of presenting those symptoms because they're so psychologically conditioned to associate, for example, fever with the mother. So upon seeing the mother, they'll start coughing, they'll start burning up, they'll start throwing up anything that they said they had. So that one I found quite shocking. And the last one I find really interesting. So in, again, Munchausen's by proxy, if the caretaker is sort of appearing to be in their element when they're in the hospital. So what I mean by this is they'll leave the victim oftentimes unattended for quite a long time and they'll go socialize around the hospital. So they'll speak to doctors, nurses, other parents, other mothers and just treat the hospital like a playground because they're so comfortable with being there and it's like a daily occurrence. So not only are they at ease, but they seem to enjoy the whole experience of of getting diagnosed, of being tested, and seeing that other person get tested. So that one's not one that's very common, and it's quite unusual. And then in terms of cures, because it's so complex, there's not really a concrete cure for this yet. The most common one is therapy, but that will only work if the patient has either admitted to Munchausen's, which almost never happens, or if the patient is at least willing to try psychoanalysis or therapy. Um, and then if therapy is taken um, as a course of treatment, there's not a lot of positive data to show that it might work. And that's because, as I said, either the patient just refuses to take it, or if the patient is mandated to take it, like if it's compulsory for them to undergo therapy, they often will just lie their way through it and say they're fine or say they didn't falsify anything, it's the doctor's fault, because that's what they've been doing this entire time. And at this point, lying like pathologically is so ingrained in themselves, that's their default response. So in terms of a cure, that's your only option. But what you can do, or what doctors can do, is make sure they know all the symptoms and all the signs, because it's something that's so overlooked, and it's, it can be muddled up really easily with different diseases. So you, I think doctors need to make sure that they are really keeping their eyes peeled. And this is where it's really important for doctors to know how a patient is interacting with them and also with their family. So if they're observant and if they're attentive, if they're attentive to detail, then they're more likely to pick up something that isn't right. And that's everything. So thank you for listening. They can, in some cases, it is a crime. Um, and actually, yeah, in most cases, because they're, especially if the child is a minor, and they're forcefully feeding them drugs. What about, so. not by proxy, but what about just money? No, then that wouldn't be considered a crime because in just Munchausen, they're doing it to themselves, they're doing it willingly. So that person's essentially just. But then, in the case that they're falsifying documents yeah. or procedures or whatever, what then? They can be stealing drugs. Yeah, so if, if that's the case, then I think you're right. But if it's just a case of. If it's. Like, there are different degrees of this. For example, someone can take the drugs and steal the drugs and then elicit a response. Or someone can do something minor like uh, faking a reaction. That wouldn't be considered a crime, but there are different degrees, and I think if, like you said, that's a good example, then they would be busted. Is there a possibility that they are unaware that they're doing it themselves? No. Quiet? What characterizes Munchausen's is that you are fully aware, at least at the start, that you're aware that you're doing this and you have somewhat of an unclear, but it's still there, an incentive in your mind. Um, whatever those, whatever that incentive might be, but it's very possible for you to. For that thought to get lost in your head, the more and more you keep up with the charade. Do you think there's a danger of doctors making their patients have that syndrome when they actually do have disorder? But it's just tests that are Yeah, it's it's there's a lot of grey area when you're diagnosing it because, like you said, that doctor has to treat the situation with a lot of sensitivity because you have to validate your patient's feelings, right? You can't just tell them that you're completely making this up, but at the same time, you can't completely give in to their delusions. 
So I think it's really difficult, um, and it definitely is a danger, but I think the doctor has to approach that situation carefully, and then in that case, they'll probably run it by their supervisor or peers at least. Can you say that again, sorry? <laughs> As you're thinking of being ill, yeah. and it affects you physically, do you think the opposite can be true? Do you think you're quite positive things about this stuff that you also want to affect you? I mean, I suppose, if you were to consider that, it probably would work both ways. But uh, there haven't, I mean, I haven't come across any studies that show that at least, but it might be a possibility. Probably just, I haven't researched that side very much.